try to invite neighbors over, you know, and they would kind of come, but they didn't really need to come, you know, but why would they want to come? It wasn't like a couple generations ago where you really depended on your neighbors. And I realized it was because we didn't need each other, because we met all our needs with money. When I was a kid, the need for um, child care was not met with money. Because neighbors would kind of look after each other's children. If you got home late from work, that was okay. Your neighbors would, would watch the kids. And everybody knew each other, so the kids were safe outside. When I was a kid, play was not a, 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 something that you would pay for. We would create worlds of the imagination. We wouldn't buy video games that did the imagining for us. Adventure wasn't something that we paid for. We would have our own adventure. We would wander for miles, unsupervised. And now the kids pay for kind of imitation adventures in these, you know, multiplayer online video games. Um, no one paid for exercise back then. But now you go to a gym and you pay for it. Um, it was rare to pay for cooking, food preparation. Mom did that. Occasionally dad, usually mom. She would go to the supermarket and buy raw ingredients and cook. Today in America, two-thirds of all meals are prepared outside of the home. I don't know what it is in England, but it's probably quite high as well. Um, go back a few more generations. Um, insurance wasn't something you paid for. If your house burnt down, all the neighbors would get together and rebuild your house. Entertainment wasn't something you paid for. Everyone would get together and sing and play instruments. Medicine wasn't something you'd pay for because folk knowledge, um, folk remedies, and herbal knowledge were widespread. So the farther back you go, the more needs were met in the community by people you knew on a gift basis, and, and the less you needed money. And today, all of these relationships have been replaced with professional relationships with distant strangers, um, which means that we have an illusion of independence and, and strive for independence. I, I would ask, when I was teaching at university, I would ask my students, what's your goal in life? And they would say, financial independence, which means I don't need anybody. But actually, this paradise is hell because it's an illusion. For one thing, you are still dependent, but just on people you don't know, and on systems that are impersonal. So it's very fragile. And secondly, these needs that are being met are only being met in a superficial way. They're, the, the quantitative needs are being met, but the qualitative needs are not being met. Sometimes, I just get sick of listening to all recorded music because there's something missing that is present when someone's actually singing to me or playing to me or when I'm engaged in group <coughs> singing. Like that, that, there's, there's something that, that can't be measured. Note for note, it might be the same when someone's singing to me, but there's a qualitative difference or when someone's cooking for me. Okay, I guess I don't want to speak for hours and hours, so um, I think maybe I'll shift gears a little bit and talk about what the future can be and where this can go. So we're facing, we're running into a transition. Um, when there are no good business plans for me to, that allow me to lend more money, when economic growth slows and the return on investment drops, then I, the bank, don't have any lending opportunities anymore. And the ability to repay the existing debts gets lower and lower and lower. People, and, and, and so bankruptcies increase, wealth concentrates in fewer and fewer hands, and the system 
collapses. In order to prevent that from happening, you have to find something else to keep economic growth going for a while. And that's what the politicians are all, in one way or another, they all agree, left, right, and center. Let's stimulate growth, ignite, reignite economic growth, increase demand, whatever their tactic, they all agree that economic growth is a good thing. And that's, so, you know, it's like fracking, you know, mountaintop removal, you know, tar sands excavation, you know, like anything, like anything to keep the game going a little longer, but it's at higher and higher cost, and less and less effective, even if you try as hard as possible. Growth is slowing down, the system stops working, and that generates a crisis, a crisis that won't go away, can't go away, unless you believe that infinite growth is possible on a finite planet. If you don't believe that, then you know that this crisis won't go away. It can only be postponed until even more existing natural wealth is depleted. So, not, so every time it's postponed, the eventual collapse gets worse. And we can feel, even the financial elites know that the crisis hasn't gone away and won't go away. They call it pretend and instead. So this crisis is not only a crisis in our financial system, it's part of a larger crisis because you may have noticed that many, many of our systems are facing a crisis. Maybe, I don't know what your, what your passion is, but education, politics, healthcare. Um, there's a growing crisis, soil, water, energy, in every realm. All of the systems and institutions built on what I call the separation, the story of separation, the story of humanity separate from nature, the story of individuals separate from each other in an impersonal universe. That is the story that's breaking down, along with everything built on top of it. The breakdown generates crises. The crises form a birth crisis that's propelling humanity into well, first into an empty space, a space where we don't know what's real anymore. We don't know who we are anymore. We don't know how to, to be effective in the world anymore. We don't know how to create, to create anymore, even. Many people on a personal level enter this space as well. When the world falls apart, it could be a divorce, it could be a health crisis, it could be a you know, financial crisis, losing your job. Everything that seems so real and secure and permanent is revealed as nothing but illusion. And there's an identity crisis. Who am I? Why am I here? What's important? What's valued? It's an empty space, a space of unknown. And that's the emptiness that draws something new. And I think that humanity is going through this, or civilization. When I say we, I'm talking about industrial society. I'm not talking about the indigenous. So, so we, civilization, are nearing this empty space. And, and it's into that empty space that a new story and a new world and new systems can be born based on a new story, which we already are catching glimpses of. <coughs> In fact, anything that's marginal, almost anything that's marginal, radical, holistic, alternative, um, most of these things are giving us a glimpse of the future. And they will stay marginal until the center disintegrates and there's that empty space for them to come in. All of our solutions, I mean, all that we need to live in beautiful harmony with the planet has already been invented, it's already there. It's not like we need you know, some new technology, nanotechnology, genetic engineering, and, and kind of more of the same, more of the technologies of control. All that we need is here, permaculture and, and renewable energy and that, those kinds of things. Um, are enough for us to live in beautiful harmony with the planet. And that's 
something that needs to be substantiated. I mean, there are people who say, no, 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 um, organic agriculture doesn't bring high enough yields to feed the planet. We need high-tech chemical agriculture. But, but um, that argument doesn't stand up to scrutiny. And uh, if, if, you, if you're interested in that, you can read articles that I've written and look at the citations. And, um, basically, um, high-tech agriculture maximizes yield per unit of labor, but not per unit of land. Anyway, the new story, and I'll just offer you my version of the new story. The new story is a story of intervening that says who you are is not a discrete, separate, Cartesian self in a universe of other. Who you are is the totality of all your relationships. Who you are is a mirror of the whole. Therefore, everything that happens in the world is happening to you, which is, I think, quite self-evident. You know, why else is it so painful to, to read about the, the dying of the seas? Why is it so painful even to read about seabirds on Midway Island that are being found dead and stuffed with plastic? Why is that painful? It's because it's happening to us. Because we're not separate. It's not because you made some uh, implicit rational calculation that your financial or reproductive self-interest is threatened. It's because it's happening to you and it hurts. If we're ignorant of these things that are happening, that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It just means that that pain gets driven underground and pervades all of our lives. A condition that, well, one symptom of it is boredom. Now why should it hurt just to be? Primitive people, quote unquote, primitive people didn't experience boredom. They were happy to literally watch the grass grow. But for us, it hurts just to be. So we crave entertainment to take us outside of ourselves and give us a respite. And I think one way to explain it is that we haven't felt the pain that's out there. We haven't gone through the grief process for all of the damage that's been done. So we know it hurts on some level. But we don't know why it hurts, we don't know what hurts, and we're so used to it that we think it's normal. And then occasionally we get a glimpse of what life is supposed to be. What it's like, what, it's, what existence is supposed to feel like. And we think, well, that's, that was amazing, that was a peak experience. And normal life is just like this, this kind of grim, uncomfortable grind. Let me see if I can get back to economics. Because <laughs> it's related. So the question, okay, so that's part of the new story, interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh calls it, interbeing. And I like that word better than oneness, although oneness might work too. On the collective level, it's the oneness of humanity and nature. The new story says, yeah, we are part of nature. Nature is part of us. And therefore, our destiny is not to become its lords and masters, not to transcend nature, not to conquer nature, not to have synthetic food and robot body parts and move <coughs> off into space and synthetic worlds. No, our, our destiny is to become the co-creative partners with nature, to be in service to nature, to, to, to be the lovers of nature. So what would an economics look like that were aligned with, these, with this new story? And in, in, in that book, I, I, I describe that. And maybe I'll... Um,
say a couple things about it. One way to approach it is to say, what would economics look like that understood what came out of that little dialogue process? That we are fundamentally motivated to express our gifts. That says, who you are? Maybe one answer to that question, who are you? Who you are is a bearer of gifts. That makes sense in a world of interbeing. Because in a world of interbeing, that in which we're not separate, then what's good for you is good for me too. So of course I want to give what is best for the whole. Because I'll be better off too. That's, in the context of our current economy, that's nonsense. I, fly, I let you have that chair, that's one less chair for me in the game of musical chairs. If I let you have that job, then I don't have a job in this world of artificial scarcity. But in a gift economy, which was most economies before the modern era, in a gift economy, more for you is more for me. Because in a gift economy, if, if I have more than I need, I will share it with someone who, who needs it. Why would I carry around two stone axes when they're heavy and we're nomadic and I only need one and you can use one too? Why would I have a big granary full of grain that's gonna, gonna molder and decay and be eaten by rats to no advantage of mine when I could give you the grain if you're having a hard year, share it with you. And then when I'm having a hard year, I know that you'll share it with me. That's how a gift economy works. The gift, go, the gift seeks the need. So in that context, there's no opposition between altruism and selfishness. And the call of our hearts is aligned with economic reality. Therefore, this division between matter and spirit no longer makes sense either. So there's a reunion that's promised. Now, these gift economies were um, generally on a small scale. How do we translate that into a global scale, into a mass society? So that's why in this book, some people think that I must be talking about a world without money, and I'm not. I am talking about reclaiming a lot of life functions from the realm of money. A lot of things that we pay for, we shouldn't pay for. We should meet those needs for each other on an intimate, interpersonal level. We should grow a lot of food for each other. We should cook for each other. We should, we should be watching our children collectively and not shipping them off to daycare. We should sing songs together more. Um, we should participate in the building of each other's houses. There's a lot of things that, that can and should be a lot more local. But there are some things that will probably always be global. The manufacture of electronics. You know. um, to the extent that we still want electronics, but, I, but I, I'm not one of the people who discards all of civilization and technology as being a good mistake. Um, so the second part of what I write about is how do we change money so that it's aligned with the principles of gift, with the principles of ecology? And I'll just give you a couple of little things, and then I'll open it up to, to questions and answers. Uh, so I feel like I have gone on a long time. So one, one, way, one thing to do, well, real quick, one thing is to internalize external costs so that pollution and resource extraction become prohibitively expensive and the cheapest product is the one that is the most environmentally sustainable. That's been written about by a lot of people. I'm not going to talk more about that. Um, instead, I'll talk about changing the way money is created. What would happen if money were like grain or axes in an ancient society, what would happen if money, instead of growing, if you have a lot of it and making you richer and richer the more you have, what would happen if, if you hoarded it, it would shrink and become less valuable? What would happen if it were not created in a way that there's always more debt than money, but if in a way that there was always less debt than money. What would happen if we arranged the game of musical chairs to that second game that I described? How would we do that? 
One way to do that is to have money decay. And this is actually, has actually been tried. Um, the famous example is the town of Wurgel, Austria, in 19, early 1930s, where they were out of money. So the mayor um, had the town print their own local money that had um, these spots for stamps on it. And to keep it valid, you had to put a stamp on it every month. That cost money. So if you had a 100 shilling note and you went for 12 months without putting your one shilling stamp on every month, by the end of the year, it would only be worth 88 shillings. Because to use it, you'd have to put 12 shillings on it. So you had an incentive to, to spend the money right away. And the, the town's economy boomed. People paid their taxes early. The town's reached full employment. They started building, you know, repairing their bridges and repairing their roads. And, and, and uh, emissaries came from all over the world to witness the Vorgel miracle and to learn from it. And they came back to the United States and they, and they, they um, planned to implement currencies like that all over the country in the Depression. Uh, I don't know if it was happening in England too, but, but then the um, currency was made illegal in Austria. The, um, all the planned currencies in America were made illegal as well. And a centralized solution was imposed instead and the Great Depression continued for a long time. Today, the modern equivalent of it would be a liquidity tax on bank reserves, which means that if I'm uh, a bank and I have a billion pounds of reserves, I know that in a year, the, the nominal value of those will be down to 950 million pounds. So it's to my advantage to lend it even at zero interest. Because then I'll have a billion pounds. I can <coughs> I can go a little bit more into the technical details. Maybe people would deposit money at negative 4% interest. I'd lend it out at 0% interest. Uh, it allows lending to happen uh, without growth. It allows the economy to work without growth. Um, and it, let's see how I can explain it. It's like, like suppose I had um, 200 loaves of bread and I want to maximize my self-interest. I don't keep those loaves of bread for myself because they'll go stale. I'd rather give everybody in this room two loaves and, and say, now you have to give me two loaves when you have more than me or when I'm hungry. It's a loan and a call. I'll ask them back two fresh loaves, just like I gave you. But we don't do that with our money because money's not like that. But we could make it like that. So that's another there's one, maybe I'll give one more little piece about that one. Um, suppose you own a forest, and you have a choice. You're the CEO of the company, you own a forest. You can clear cut that forest and make a billion pounds of profit. Um, clear cut it, pave it over, destroy it forever, a billion pounds. Or you can log it sustainably and earn 10 million pounds a year in perpetuity. What would you do? <laughs> if you were rational, you will clear cut it and deposit that billion pounds of interest and make 30 million pounds a year, not just 10 million. And if you don't do that, you're going to be fired as CEO or sued for failing with fiduciary responsibility of your position because you're not maximizing shareholder value. Or a corporate raider will come and say, hey, you have an underperforming asset. That forest, you're only earning 10 million a year from it. You could be earning 30 million a year. So I'm going to buy your company, clear cut the forest, raise your revenue, and based on the higher stock price that that raised revenue will bring, sell a company and make a big profit. Market forces will force you to defend yourself against that, against that possibility by clear cutting the forest and preemptively raising your stock price. So anyway, am I losing people here? So I, need to, I need to show up soon. But let me just say, what happens, suppose you're not the CEO of that company. Suppose you're the CEO of Earth. 
you're the president of the world, and aliens come to you and they say, I'd like to make you a business proposal. Right now, sustainable gross world product is, I don't know, $80 trillion a year. I'm going to make you an offer. $10 quadrillion dollars for the Earth. We're going to drain the oceans, extract the core, and pulverize the, the planet. But think how rich you'll be. The interest alone <laughs> on $10 quadrillion dollars is much more than gross world product. Will you take that? Take my offer. President, Mr. President. <laughs> of course you wouldn't take that offer. But the thing is, we are taking that offer right now, liquidating the planet for short-term profit. It probably depends, doesn't it? It's if, you're, if you're the leader of the world, you're a psychopath. If you are, you would. And the problem is, there's a lot of psychopaths around the world. Psychopaths, yeah. That, that's another topic we can get into. But <laughs> right now, even if most of us aren't psychopaths, we're still participating in that decision to liquidate the world for profit. It's built into the system. So I guess now is a good time to, to, um, to open it up to questions. Really, all of this does rest on um, the paradigm of gift. There's a reason why we all desire to give. Why everybody in this room wants to give. It's because we're born into gratitude. Because this world is a gift, and our lives are a gift. And I'm not, you know, being religious here. I'm just saying, we didn't earn our birth. You didn't earn your mother taking care of you and nursing you. We didn't earn the sun. We didn't earn the soil. We didn't earn any of this. It was all given to us without our earning. Our lives are a gift, and that means that we are naturally in a state of gratitude, which is the knowledge of having received and the desire to give in turn. And that's why, even if you have successfully maximized your security and reproductive self-interest, you won't be happy or fulfilled if you're not giving your gifts towards something beautiful to you, something meaningful. You'll think, I wasn't put on earth to do this. If you're in a relationship or a job, well, you're not giving your gifts. So my, my, I guess my take-home message, if nothing else, is to trust that knowledge in yourself. That doesn't mean to panic about it. And it doesn't mean to beat yourself up if you find yourself not fully giving your gifts, or if you find yourself in a situation where you lots of gifts. It doesn't mean you have to do something about it. But what happens is when you recognize and validate and know yourself as a giver, as a gift bearer, from that knowledge, action will happen. Things that had seemed tolerable will become intolerable. The compensatory rewards for not living in your gift become less attractive. And then, the more that you're in that zone, the more you trust it the more opportunities will arise that you couldn't have contrived or predicted to allow you to take the next step into expressing the gifts in a very natural process. So you might try that. Um, just for a moment. <coughs> Touch on that desire deep in you to be a giver and that knowledge that you are. And just rest in that for 
half a minute. There might be doubt around it, anger, pain, frustration, but it's there nonetheless. Cynicism. This is New Age bullshit. <laughs> Judgments. Could be. There might be a whole cloud of those around it, but there it is and you know it. And if you walk out of here carrying that, something will happen. An opportunity. 